tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Nobody seems to give a damn, and it's very frustrating. How the BC Coroner's Service is creating a national information gap on impaired and distracted driving deaths, also. So we know we're not really doing enough to protect our pedestrians on the road. Metro Vancouver's most dangerous pedestrian intersections, and... And we also see higher risks for uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Sleep researchers say BC is ignoring the serious health risks of switching to permanent daylight time. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, Anita is off tonight. Impaired and distracted drivers kill hundreds of people in our country every year. And policymakers are dealing with a dangerous blind spot when tracking those fatalities, especially here in our province. It's because the BC Coroner's Service is failing to share important data about deaths. As the CBC's Jonathan Gatehouse reports, BC's been dragging its heels for almost a decade. Just like everywhere else in the country, twisted wreckage and roadside memorials are all too common in British Columbia. I see in the car sitting there and I seen, I seen it, I seen it all. Yet it could be years before these impaired driving tragedies show up in Canada's national statistics. That's because the BC Coroner's Service has repeatedly failed to share its numbers with other agencies. Nobody seems to give a damn and it's very frustrating. The CEO of Mothers Against Drunk Driving Canada says those numbers are critical to figuring out what's working and what's not. People ask me all the time, ask our organization, ask our volunteers, what's happening on our roadways, are you seeing anything? Not a chance. We're sitting on some legislative changes that we know have worked for alcohol and would they work really well for cannabis, but until we have the data, governments won't listen to us because they're not going to make a change in legislation until there's proof and proof comes in data. The BC Coroner Service says it's been delinquent with the numbers because it's been consumed by the demands of the opioid crisis. However, the data delays started long before the spike in overdose deaths. BC also blames staff turnover and the switch from paper files to electronic ones. In an email today, the Coroner Service suggests the numbers will be ready sometime early next year. That process has unfortunately taken more time than we expected, but is near completion, they wrote. The impact is significant. BC usually accounts for 10 to 15 percent of Canada's road fatalities. And the huge gap in the national data sharpens the contrast with the U.S., where coroners in all 50 states must share their numbers within months, not years. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. The number of drug overdose deaths has dropped in BC compared to the same time last year. But the chief coroner is warning the public to remain cautious. Lisa LaPointe says thousands are still overdosing on illicit drugs, but not dying. There are concerns the illegal drug supply in the province remains unpredictable and toxic. And the crisis is far from over. There were 69 suspected overdose deaths in October, down 42% from last October. BC paramedics responded to more than 20,000 overdose calls from January to October. Fentanyl and similar drugs were detected in about 85% of drug deaths. A well-known advocate for keeping the RCMP in Surrey met with Solicitor General Mike Farnworth to plead her case today. Darlene Bennett's husband, Paul, was killed in their driveway in June last year in a case of mistaken identity. Bennett is concerned Surrey is creating its own police force instead of beefing up its existing police and firefighting resources. She says Mayor Doug McCallum's team is holding the city hostage and wants the province to get involved. And she doesn't want anyone else living through what her family is going through after their loss. I'm disappointed. I, I really am. I think some the province needs to step in and stop this. It, it's ridiculous. It's nonsense. It's, it's putting lives in danger. And I think, you know, a, a fundamental right is safety and security. And I think someone needs to step up and, and make that happen. Earlier, Farnworth said resourcing is a municipal responsibility to work out with the detachment. 
municipal policing is the responsibility of the, uh, the local government uh, and that uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the, the size of the detachment or whether or not to hire uh, uh, additional police, that is the, that's what they're elected to do and that uh, the issue should be resolved uh, between the, uh, the city of Surrey and the, uh, the detachment. And it's not just police feeling the budget freeze in Surrey. Firefighters there are also facing that budget shortfall and it's also drawing criticism. But as Jesse Johnson explains tonight, the city's fire chief insists council's belt tightening measures won't pose a threat to public safety. In the second largest city in the province and one of the 10 biggest in Canada, the union that represents firefighters says they're overworked and understaffed. Typically what you will see most fire departments in the region are have a um, for every resident for every firefighter is about 800 residents. And so in Surrey, we are at one firefighter for every 1,500 residents, so, which is almost double what, what we're seeing in the region from some of the other neighboring municipalities. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. The budget council passed this week includes $130 million over the next five years to replace the RCMP with a municipal police force. The city's police and fire chief both asked the mayor for more resources, but money is tight around City Hall. So both requests were turned down. I personally talked to both, and both of them assured me that um, we could get by this year with it and, and continue to make our city safe. So we need to address that with more resources. Surrey's fire chief agrees with 364 firefighters, which is less than half of Vancouver's total, he can keep the city safe. But he says he can't keep it up for long. You know, I did say that, you know, we will make do for another year. We're willing to delay our requests so Council can achieve its priorities for this year. And uh, that's how the process unfolded. But the need is going to be there. It's not going away. The union isn't as convinced that everything will be okay. McRae is concerned about response times and firefighters getting burned out. We don't want to see our, our response times have be negatively impacted because our our calls for service are increasing due to infrastructure, population, congestion, and not have the resources to deal with it. So he says they'll do their best to keep up in a big city that's rapidly getting bigger with no new firefighters. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, sir. Well, ride hailing is supposed to be up and running in our province by Christmas. And now a report on one of the biggest players in the business is documenting some startling numbers about sexual assault in the United States. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us now live with more on this. So Dan, who is the uh, player and what are these stats? Mike, it is Uber and this information came out just this afternoon. The company says it received more than 3,000 reports of sexual assault, including rape, related to its trips in the U.S. last year where it operated more than 1.3 billion rides. Uber says those numbers are in fact lower than 2017 in several categories. It says more than 99% of rides did not have any reported safety issues and drivers were often the victims, with riders accounting for about half of the accused parties in cases of sex assault. Still, this report comes as Uber faces pressures from regulators in many cities. London recently pulled Uber's license to carry passengers over a, quote, pattern of failures on safety and security. The head of the company says they would be better off for publishing this information. And the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network in the U.S. says it appreciates Uber's transparency. This release, though, will likely catch the eyes of cities across Metro Vancouver and our province as they consider safety issues for both drivers and passengers when it comes to ride hailing. Several have already announced they are ready for the service. Mike. All right, Dan, thanks. Dan Burrett, live tonight. Well, this is the last month you will ever have to pay an MSP bill. Medical services plan premiums will be eliminated this January, as promised. Premier John Horgan reminded British Columbians today of the NDP's campaign commitment. According to government numbers, families will save up to $1,800 a year. Individuals are in line to save up to $900 in 2020. Health Minister Adrian Dick stressed the impact it'll have for people in his own riding. But it really reflects by eliminating medical services premiums in our first budgets in contrast to doubling them what I think our commitment to affordability is so and it means for those people who live and work on Kingsway who sometimes work in a job and then run their own small business it means everything to them.
Finance Minister Carol James says the tax cut runs around $800 million. We are one of the past provinces in the country to still have health care premiums. Even though you won't have an MSP bill, residents will still need to be enrolled to take advantage of provincial health care. Well, a win for BC's nurses tonight. They wanted to decide for themselves if they would get the flu shot, not have the other province order them to be vaccinated or wear a mask. But as Deborah Goble reports, despite the battle, they will probably still get the shot. What a difference five years makes. Nurses in B.C. are no longer required to get the flu vaccine or wear a mask in patient care areas after a new agreement was reached with the Health Employers Association of B.C. this week. So the nurse will make a decision based on the evidence presented to her during flu season uh, whether the flu vaccine is the right choice for him or her. But back in 2014, there was no such wiggle room. If a health care worker refused to get a flu shot, then they had to wear a mask or face disciplinary measures. Nurses argued it confused patients and made it difficult for some to hear what was being said. But the province stood firm, calling it a matter of life and death. We lose about 500 people every year that die from the flu. This is not something to you know, shrug about. This is something we need to take positive action. And the medical health officer in 2014 backed him up. We know that influenza vaccine works. Uh, it's, it protects us and it protects our patients. Um, we know that masks work as well. The latest statistics from the Health Employers Association of BC shows 79% of all healthcare workers who work in residential care got the flu vaccine, while 76% of healthcare workers in acute care, that includes hospitals, are immunized. Some of the systems we haven't in place, I think, haven't been working well enough. So we're sitting down and working with nurses to see that they get that we raise levels of immunization by not being punitive, but by working together to raise those levels. And I think that's what we're doing. Nurses are very well-educated professionals. They are able to weigh uh, evidence and make decisions uh, on evidence. They do it every day in their jobs. The agreement does require the health authority to track those health care workers who continue to refuse a flu shot. And in the case of an extreme flu outbreak, the influenza prevention policy, including masks, will be reinstated temporarily. Deborah Govel, CBC News, Vancouver. The province's plan to bring in permanent daylight time is getting more pushback tonight. Scientists say the move comes with serious health implications, and they've written the government expressing their concerns. But as Bethany Lindsay explains, their open letter remains unanswered. Well, good Thursday morning. I'm Stephen Quinn. This is the early edition on CBC Radio 1. It's not always easy to get up in the morning. But it's even harder in the dark. How would you feel if you uh, if the sun didn't come up till 9 a.m.? Depressed. Well, people want to wake up in the light so they know what's going on. <laughs> That'll be the reality in Vancouver for more than a month if B.C. goes ahead and makes daylight time permanent. The idea is wildly popular, except with people who study sleep and circadian rhythms. What happens is that we are getting much less light exposure in the morning. Six researchers wrote to the province in October, advising against the move to permanent daylight time. We will be very fatigued having to get up this early in the winter months. It will be really hard. It will be hard for children at school. It will be hard for anyone having to get up at 7 a.m. in the pitch dark. And it's not just fatigue. And we also see higher risks for uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which are consequences of not getting enough sleep and having disturbed circadian rhythms. The researchers haven't had any response from the government, and MLAs have voted to enable BC to make the switch. Government ministers turned down our request for an interview. The province says it's listening to all opinions. But if Western states move to permanent daylight time, it only makes sense for us to do the same. When the province polled British Columbians about the plan, 93% were in support. But there were only two choices, stick with the time changes in spring and fall or go to permanent daylight time. The choice to stay on standard time was also not provided in that consultation. 
Green Party MLAs were the only ones who voted against the plan, calling the consultation process fundamentally flawed. I think it's really important if, if there's going to be government consultation with the public, that the public really understand the questions that they're being asked and the implications of those questions. Sleep researchers agree. They want to get rid of the time change too, but they say permanent standard time, the time we have in winter, is the better choice. We should expect that this will improve our sleep, it will improve our mood. Uh, morning light exposure is very important for, um, for our mental health. The big downside of permanent standard time, saying goodbye to those long summer nights. Either way, the sleep researchers hope the sun won't set on their concerns before the switch is final. Bethany Lindsay, CBC News, Vancouver. And meteorologist Brad Soderholm joins us now with uh, more on the uh, reality of permanent daylight time. Let, let's first of all look, though, at how things stand right now. Yeah, exactly. As we get closer and closer to the winter solstice, of course, the sun is rising later and later. Today, for example, December 5th, Vancouver, the sunrise, 7.51 in the morning. In Prince George, that was 8.12. In Dees Lake, far to the northwest, already rising after 9 o'clock. But let's imagine now that we're getting to the so a winter solstice next year. We're in permanent daylight time. That means the sun is not going to be rising in Vancouver until 5 after 9. Prince George, 9.27. And Dees Lake, almost 10.30 in the morning. Morning. But keep in mind, this is one season. Of course, when we look at the summertime, it's going to be a little bit of a different story. And of course, this is all assuming that we can even see the sun when it rises, because occasionally there is rain, as we know, that falls here on the south coast. And a live look at our satellite and radar imagery shows that rain is on its way. It's kind of in the last few frames there over southern portions of Vancouver Island. That is going to be pushing into our region throughout the next few hours and lasting the overnight. Temperatures pretty close to seasonal, where they should be anywhere between 5 and 6 Six degrees but if you look at this look ahead what you're gonna notice showers by about midnight tonight that's pretty confident there we're likely gonna get a bit of a break tomorrow morning mostly a cloudy start to the day but late afternoon into tomorrow night well that's gonna be showers round two and that's of course all from a separate system stateside so when I come back I'll tell you all about that okay thanks very much talk to you in a bit well TransLink is offering a new way to get on the bus and train a keychain sized rendition of the Compass car. There it is. It's called the Compass Mini, and it'll be available tomorrow. 7,500 of them released at launch, and if they're as popular as the Compass wristbands, don't be surprised if they run out fast. Riders can claim the Compass Mini at the customer service counter at Stadium Chinatown, Skytrain Station, and at the West Coast Express office at Waterfront Station. Keychain does come with a string attached. You'll need to put down Six dollars as a refundable deposit to get one. Our ongoing look into pedestrian safety on Metro Vancouver roads takes us tonight to the one of the worst spots for crashes involving pedestrians. According to the most recent ICBC data, the intersection at Lowheed Highway and North Road in Burnaby had the second highest number of accidents. Our Jason D'Souza met up with a medical health officer who specializes in road safety to see how design can play a key role in making our roads safer. So we've got about four lanes of traffic on each side. We've got some uh, lanes that are called slip lanes, which enable cars to make those turns more quickly. We also have roads intersecting at an angle. One of the challenges when you have roads intersecting at an angle is that when drivers are trying to make a turn, for example, turn right on red or turn left, because they're often not encompassing where the pedestrians might be moving. So it makes it more challenging for them to actually keep their eyes where they need to to maintain safety. Slowing down crossing speeds can be one real improvement for pedestrian safety. Another really big improvement that we can make is something called a leading pedestrian interval. So here the idea is the light changes for pedestrians a few seconds before it changes for cars. And it's been shown to have incredible safety improvements for pedestrians with really without any cost. I mean, it's incredibly cheap to change a signal. Uh, so those are just a few quick ideas that cities can use to improve pedestrian safety. Uh, I'm quite sure there are probably a number of people listening to us right now as they sit in their car stuck in traffic and seeing that traffic get worse as their commute continues, who, who might be a bit frustrated to hear that, uh, you know, some of these potential solutions means their commute becomes even more complicated and potentially even longer. What would you say to that? 
Well, I would say that giving alternative modes of transportation support actually can improve the roads for everyone. So we know that crashes, for example, are a significant source of congestion. Uh, so making the roads more reliable and predictable serves everyone. Road safety is really an underappreciated issue in terms of the risk it poses to health. So we actually know that the impact to health in terms of premature death and disability of road safety is very similar to that of other health conditions that we pay a lot more attention to. So for example, it's comparable to the impact of diabetes. Uh, it, its health impact is very comparable to the impact of lots of infectious diseases. But we don't really give it as much attention. And yet we have very serious health outcomes, lots of early death, terrible lifelong disability resulting from road traffic injuries. So it's really something as healthcare providers, it's really important. Yes, it is. And you can read more about uh, dangerous intersections on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. We are also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, Canada's speech from the throne was a little well, out of this world today, Governor General and former astronaut Julie Payette, words from the outer reaches to the throne speech today. Coming up, the more down-to-earth reaction from the opposition. All right, thanks for staying with us online, where we are always ad-free during the television commercial break. This is Throwback Thursday, and tonight... Diving back into a hazy past from 33 years ago when Vancouver City Council banned smoking in most public places and in the workplace. That news had some smokers huffing and puffing in frustration. Karen Webb has this report. This is what Vancouver's health department wants, a smoke-free workplace. And now the law says any employee who wants it will get it. Smokers have the right to smoke. If they have information uh, and they make an informed choice to continue smoking, that is their right, until it conflicts with the rights of non-smokers to breathe clean air. Chris Williams. For some offices, the best solution was to quit, cold turkey. No one smokes at this Vancouver law firm. Not the staff, not the lawyers, not even the clients. Some places have had problems. At Langara College, the required signs have been properly posted. But the college administration has decided it can't and won't police 6,000 students. There are very few places the law allows for smoking. So, in the cafeteria, the smokers still puff away in the non-smoking section. There have been several arguments and even a few fistfights. Given the population, 6,000, if there's any, only one zealot in 1,000, we've got six of them. And in fact, we've got about one zealot per hundred on both sides of the fence. Really and at some a, offices, a there has been a great deal of resentment. Somebody who's here for 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the afternoon, if they were in a bad mood one day and I take them off, could decide, okay, fine, you can't smoke at work anymore. But Teresa works for the federal government. And in the federal government, the city has found a determined opponent. Ottawa says the city bylaw doesn't apply to it or to federal crown corporations. Vancouver's health department said it would more than welcome the chance to take on the federal government First in court. It was a very different time for certain, I report from CBC's Karen Webb from 33 years ago. All right, going back a little further into our archives tonight, we want to wish the Bloedel Conservatory an early birthday. They're celebrating their 50th birthday tomorrow. Conceptualized in 1967, a donation of $1.25 million by lumber baron Prentice Bloedel helped make construction possible. It took almost a year and a half and 10,000 people attended the opening December 6th, 1969. Now, it is the largest single structure floral conservatory in the country. You may remember the conservatory nearly closed in 2010 due to park board budget cuts, but a plan to partner it with the Van Dusen Botanical Garden saved the conservatory. Happy 50th to them. All right, stay with us back in just a few seconds with more national and international news.
MPs took their seats in the House of Commons today for the first time since the federal election. Then the action moved to the Senate chamber where the Liberal government laid out its agenda in the throne speech. The CBC's Julie Van Dusen was there. The opening of Parliament is steeped in tradition and ceremony. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau now heads a minority government. The message from Canadians, work together, collaborate. While your approaches may differ, you share the common belief that government should try, whenever possible, to make life better for Canadians. The government's first step to cut taxes for all but the wealthiest of Canadians, a promise to invest in affordable housing and cut the cost of cell and wireless services by 25%. A clear majority of Canadians voted for ambitious climate action now. The government vows to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, in part through a price on pollution, making energy efficient homes and electric cars more affordable and planting two billion trees. And while the government calls climate action the defining challenge of the time, it's mindful of the growing discontent in the oil patch. It will also work just as hard to get Canadian resources to new markets and offer unwavering support to the hardworking women and men in Canada's natural resources sector. The government says it will compensate Indigenous children harmed under the discriminatory child welfare system in a fair and timely way. It vows to ban military-style assault rifles, and municipalities that want to ban handguns will be able to do so. It promises to work towards all Canadians having access to a family doctor, and Pharmacare gets a push forward. But dental care, as proposed by the NDP, only gets a mention that it's worth exploring. Opposition leaders reacted quickly. So today's throne speech was, uh, I believe, an insult to the people of Alberta and Saskatchewan for not recognizing uh, the, 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 the anger and the sentiments uh, that exist there. Right? I'm going to support the speech because I see in that speech many opportunities for us to not to take what is intended to be given because it's not that clear, but to get things, to make some gains for Quebec. I am not happy with this throne speech and what I'm looking for is something more than this. Opposition parties will have chances to vote in the coming days, both on the throne speech and other legislation. A move to topple the government so quickly after an election seems highly unlikely. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. The U.S. Democrats are moving forward with impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump. For only the fourth time in U.S. history, Formal charges will be drawn up against the president. And while Trump could be impeached by Christmas, his removal from office remains unlikely. The CBC's Katie Simpson explains why. Knowing her decision could further divide an already fractured country, Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she has no choice but to act, arguing the president abused the power of his office and that now is the time to hold Donald Trump to account. Today, I am asking our chairman to proceed with articles of impeachment. Lawmakers will draw up those articles outlining the high crimes and misdemeanors Democrats say Trump committed over his alleged pressuring of Ukraine to investigate his political rivals. Are you worried, sir, about the state of impeachment might have on your legacy? No, not at all. No, not at all. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. It's a big, fat hoax. Republicans are repeating that same message, saying the impeachment process is a way for the Democrats to extract revenge for losing the 2016 election. With the Speaker's announcement, she has weakened this nation. It was not new news. They always had this pre-written timeline from the day they got sworn in. Nothing about this is personal, says Pelosi. Do you hate the president, Madam Speaker? Because I don't, I don't hate anybody. I don't Collins, have a great athlete out. We don't hate anybody, not anybody in the world. She took great offense to that suggestion and in a rare display of frustration said this is about democracy. I was raised in a way that is full, a heart full of love and always prayed for the president. And I still pray for the president. I pray for the president all the time. So don't mess with me when it comes to words like that. 
Democrats hold the balance of power in the House, so Trump is expected to be impeached, though his removal from office is unlikely. If the House votes to impeach the president, it would trigger a trial in the Senate. The Republicans have a majority there, and it is very unlikely they would vote to remove him from office. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. It looks like a grocery store. It is stocked like a grocery store. Why it's not after the break. A quick look at some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Until we have the data, governments won't listen to us because they're not going to make a change in legislation until there's proof. The BC Coroner's Service is dragging its heels in sharing important data with national agencies on impaired and distracted driving fatalities. Mothers Against Drunk Driving says it's creating a national information gap. 
Intersections we know are a high collision area for everyone on the road, but it's really important that we design them with pedestrian safety in mind uh, because pedestrians actually have experienced disproportionate risks on the road. We are mapping out Metro Vancouver's most dangerous pedestrian intersections. Go to cbc.ca slash bc to find them and hear what experts suggest to make them safer. And we also see higher risks for uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which are consequences of not getting enough sleep and having disturbed circadian rhythms. Researchers say health risk warnings are being ignored as BC moves to permanent daylight time. They think permanent standard time would be better for all British Columbians. Well, it looks like a grocery store and it's stocked like a grocery store. But the market at the Mustard Seed Street Church has one key difference. There's no checkout line. CBC's Adam Vanderswan explains why the charity renovated its space to improve its customers' experience. It has bread and dairy aisles and a fresh array of crisp fruits and vegetables. At first glance, you wouldn't even guess this space is a food bank. Well, all of a sudden we've said, you know what, you're valuable. We want to set you up for success. Hmm, look at this gorgeous place. Yeah. Come and shop, not a big deal. Janine Boyce is the Director of Development at the Mustard Seed Street Church in Victoria. It's been one year since the charity's food bank was renovated to give users a comfortable grocery store experience. Boyce says the decision to move from pre-made food hampers to offering customers a choice on what to eat has had her witness some small but incredible things. Recently we had um, a woman come through and she said after all the crisis and challenge going into a new home because she does 30 days there and then she has to go to a new home she was able to pick her daughter's favorite cookie so simple but as moms showing love through food is a big deal the space was renovated with the help of hero work a local nonprofit that upgrades buildings that house charities it looks rustic inviting professional and even has images of volunteers on the walls Anita Zacker is an employee who, as a single mom, used to use the food bank regularly. She says the radical redesign has brought dignity back to the community. I think that the new market has um, taken away a lot of the stigma um, and negative thoughts about food banks. And it's really opening people's eyes that, you know what, I do need help and it's okay to go. The fresh produce is rescued from local supermarkets through the charity's food bank recovery program. Hello, Mustard Seed Guest Services. Diane Lynn Pearson is the Guest Services Coordinator. She says the market has brought a palpable wellness to the community by offering choice for those with special religious or dietary needs. I heard from one of our longtime volunteers that some of the um, people using our services visibly look in better health when they come in. But Boyce says with the redesign comes new challenges. The success of the market has created more need for volunteers and there are still some food bank items that always seem to run short. Basic hygiene products and soaps and dish detergents, items that you need in your house. When a parent has to choose between milk or uh, a bottle of so dish soap, they're going to choose the milk. Also tuna, salmon and other canned proteins are especially in demand. Boyce says if you would eat it or use it, please donate it. Adam Vanderswan, CBC News, Victoria. And you can help programs just like Mustard Seed by participating in our Open House and Food Bank Day tomorrow. Visit us at our Vancouver studios to help support food banks right across BC. Our doors are open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. with tours in the newsroom from 8 until 3. And if you can't make it to see us in person, you can donate online. More details at cbc.ca slash open house. 6.38 on this Thursday evening. Take a look carefully, top left part of your screen. Well, it's going out there, but that is the dome of the Bloedel Conservatory up at Queenie Park, the much loved dome. As we mentioned, celebrating its 50th birthday tomorrow. We'll take you inside and also have your full weather coming up.
Brent Soderholm is back. Uh, the rain is back. Yeah. Apparently. It is. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of felt today was one of those very unremarkable days, it, weather-wise. There was nothing. It, we're just, not going to make any note of it. <laughs> no, no. Just some clouds. We had a few brief showers, but really, aside from that, temperatures right about seasonal. Mm. Yeah, we're going to forget about this one. But in case you do want to reminisce on this morning, why don't you take a look at this time lapse here? I mean... I think it's nothing spectacular, but it is certainly a testament to the weather that we would be expecting here in Vancouver for the first week of December. Lots of cloud temperature fluctuations there, a little bit uh, unusual, but for the most part, this was a day that was just a little bit of everything there, and it's likely going to be continuing with the addition, of course, of a little bit of rain. I do want to start farther away from Vancouver, though. This area, once again, into eastern portions of BC, just getting a yet sn snowstorm after snowstorm, and right Right now, Environment Canada has issued a snowfall warning for any travel along the Trans Canada between Eagle Pass and Rogers Pass, so that includes Revelstoke and Golden. We could be seeing up to 25 centimeters of snow accumulate there by tomorrow morning, so certainly something to be mindful of. For us, of course, no snow down at this lower elevation, but we are going to be dealing with showers, so this is going to be starting roughly around midnight tonight, and it's going to be coming in waves, so we'll see a few breaks by tomorrow morning. However, that's going to be getting a little bit stronger, and then it's going to ease, and then you're going to think it's going to be done, but by the afternoon, we're going to get into another round, and that's really when some of the heaviest rain is going to be starting to fall. And as is tradition, yeah, this is going to be impacting your Saturday. This is, of course, that stateside system that I've been alluding to throughout the show and throughout the week, and it's going to be bringing some widespread rain to us throughout much of Saturday before it finally clears out on Sunday. So you're going to get at least one nice day in there, but unfortunately not both. 10 to 20, 20 excuse me, 10 to 20 millimeters of rain is largely what we can be expecting across much of the lower mainland. If you're a little bit farther south, say toward White Rock, that's probably only going to be about 10 millimeters or so. What you are going to notice, though, is certainly the temperatures, both Friday and Saturday, double digits expected, 10 degrees. Come Sunday and Monday, those are going to be the two nice days with some sunshine. And come next Tuesday, well, it's going to be back into that rainy pattern. All right, look forward to that. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Well, some young hockey fans on Vancouver's downtown east side got a chance to play street hockey today with Vancouver Canuck and Stanley Cup champion Jay Beagle. You know, it's it's always a blast when I get to come to uh, different organizations, especially one like Union, you know, Gospel. It um, does so much good for the community. The game was arranged by Union Gospel Mission to try to teach kids some hockey skills and the value of setting goals. Kids were from low-income families and wouldn't always have the opportunity to go to a Canucks game or meet an NHL player. Measles, a disease that was largely eradicated, but it's on the rise again. Why and where its impact is being felt next.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Your favorite holiday tradition is back. It's CBC Radio Canada's 33rd Annual Open House and Food Bank Day on December 6th. Join me and your favorite CBC personalities at 700 Hamilton Street for live broadcasts, musical performances, and tours of the newsroom. Last year, we raised over $800,000 for local food banks across BC. Anti-government demonstrations have erupted in Iran, and the regime is cracking down on protesters. But after weeks of conflict, it's only now that we're getting to see the scale of the brutality there. CBC's Renee Filippone has more. So here we can see one, a member of the security forces come out and shoot directly at the protesters. An Amnesty International researcher shows video it has verified from Iran in recent weeks. She won't show her face, afraid of repercussions for her family in Iran. The reaction of the Iranian authorities to these protests was extremely swift and very brutal. Numerous videos from different cities show security forces firing at protesters. The backlash started in mid-November when the government doubled gas prices. People were already struggling to get by following U.S. sanctions. The regime shut down the internet as the unrest grew. The U.S. believes more than a thousand people have been killed. Now is the time for all nations to stand with the Iranian people, diplomatically isolate the regime, and sanction those officials who are responsible for murdering innocent Iranians. Iran's president blames foreign governments for meddling. And state TV has characterized the confrontations as rioters and thugs armed with guns who need to be shot to save lives. For now, the protests have been crushed. There is no doubt that we will witness more protests on even a bigger scale. This Iranian Nobel Peace Prize winner says uprisings in the past have failed, but thinks this time things will be different. For over 20 years, various ways of reforming the system have been tried. Unfortunately, they've all been to no avail. So the people have come to the conclusion that reforms cannot be realized with this regime and this constitution. The question is, will these new demonstrations spark a larger movement or an even tougher government crackdown? Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. The Pacific nation of Samoa is struggling to control a deadly measles epidemic. It's a severe situation there, but not an isolated one, according to the World Health Organization. CBC Health reporter Christine Burak has the latest. 20 children are in critical condition. Nearly 60 others have died from measles in Samoa. With a population about the size of Regina, everyone on the island is now on lockdown. We want to get everyone at home. We have uh, close to 200 teams going out to vaccinate the population. May sound extreme, but new numbers from the World Health Organization paint a deadly picture. Measles infected nearly 10 million people in 2018 and killed 142,000, most of them babies and children under the age of five who had not been vaccinated. The worst affected countries include Congo, Madagascar and Ukraine. Health officials say this year is shaping up to be even deadlier. We are on a trajectory that is going in absolutely the wrong direction. <laughs> the United States is now seeing its highest number of measles cases in 25 years. Several European countries, including Britain, have lost their measles-free status following large outbreaks. Experts say they're being fueled by fringe groups spreading misinformation about vaccines. We've had anti-vaccine voices since the time of vaccines in the 1700s. That's, that's not new. What's new in the past uh, five, ten years is the megaphone that they have. That megaphone is social media, and it's being used to plant seeds of doubt all over the world. My fear is that people will continue to uh, choose not to protect themselves or their loved ones against vaccine preventable illnesses. Canada has seen about 40 measles cases this year, but given how contagious the virus is, specialists say one person with measles can land in a community and infect many others. There are pockets in Canada where the prevalence of vaccination 
is lower than what it should be. And it's no surprise that if measles is introduced into those communities, we're going to see uh, subsequent cases of measles infections nearby. While some have forgotten what the deadly virus can do, others are seeing the consequences firsthand. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. When a frontline forest firefighter was struggling with the stress and horrors of her job, she turned to art. We'll introduce you to an unusual artist who turned her day job into a passion project next. CBC's Open House and Food Bank Day is Friday, December 6th. All of our listeners come down and they get to see their public broadcaster. For more info, go to cbc.ca slash open house. Okay, when a wildfire started and others were evacuated, she ran toward the flames. Mm -hmm. As a BC forest firefighter, Elizabeth Ramsey's job was to save homes in the forest around her. But that fight was an emotionally draining one, so for one firefighter, art became therapy. In this CBC Arts Profile, meet an artist making her art in an unusual setting. People have left Williams Lake. The town still isn't under a mandatory evacuation order. If the winds shift and the fire starts moving into the community, it will become a mandatory evacuation order there. <laughs> Something kicks in, everything slows down. It's like everything stops. My name is Elizabeth Ramsey, and um, in 2017 and 2018, I was a wildland firefighter.
an integral part of firefighting was having things like reading materials, uh, someone would bring a guitar, I brought an art kit. It helped me understand how I could process something, process a day in work, and how I could connect, but also how I could connect with others. I found power in creating art when I create something dark that expresses something true within myself. I find that it, it is it's like sucking out the poison if I create a solution. I often painted the sky not as it was, but how I wish it would be. I paint I painted days not as they were, but how I hoped they would be in the future. Because it was devastating, especially the ones I knew to have been totally preventable. There were paintings that captured the berries, the pine cones, the understanding of what good can come from a forest fire. I learned how to paint fire, and it was not it was not what I was looking for. I prefer to see the green. My goal in life is to help people, everyone and anyone who's willing to use art to, uh, to find themselves and to find their place in this world so that we can come together. Pretty powerful stuff there. Nice. That's her escape, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the lines that stuck with me most, though, is how she said, I painted days not as they were, but how they should be. That's a way to try to turn something that was very clearly like a negative situation into something a little bit more positive, trying to find the good in everything. And I think that's a great way to deal with something that must Absolutely. be very tough. So, there you go. Very cool. Um, just a reminder, it's uh, CBC Open House Food Bank Day tomorrow. Is. Building is open from uh, 6 to 6, tours from 8 to 3. Uh -huh. We're going to be here, Anita's going to be here, the whole crew is going to be here. So come on and uh, stop by and make a donation to the food bank and, uh, and by all means say hello. Yeah, and if you want to be coming around here to play on the weather set, that's oh, going to yeah. be available too. So it loves that. It'll be a lot of fun. Dan's here at 11 after the National. We will leave you right now with photos of the Bloedel Conservatory in Queenie Park taken by our Maggie McPherson on the eve of its 50th anniversary. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care.